The Vilbar Party by Evelyn E. Smith. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anamika. The Vilbar Party by Evelyn E. Smith. The Persils are giving a Vilbar party tomorrow night, Professor Slude said cajolingly. You will come this time, won't you, Gnarly? Gnarly Gazan rubbed his forehead fretfully. You know how I feel about parties, Karn. He took a frismill nut out of the tray on his desk and nibbled it in annoyance. But this is in your honor, Gnarly. A farewell party. You must go. It would be... it would be unthinkable if you didn't. Karn Sleuth's eyes were pleading. He could not possibly be held responsible for his friend's antisocial behavior, and yet, Gnarly knew, he would somehow feel at fault. Gnarly sighed. He supposed he would have to conform to public sentiment on this particular instance, but he was damned if he would give in gracefully. After all, what's so special about the occasion? I'm just leaving to take another teaching job, that's all. He took another nut. That's all? Slude's face swelled with emotion. You can't really be that indifferent. Another job, that's all it is to me, Gnarly persisted. At an exceptionally high salary, of course where I wouldn't dream of accepting a position so inconveniently located. Slood was baffled and hurt and outraged. You have been honored by being the first of our people to be offered an exchange professorship on another planet, he said stiffly, and you call it just another job. Why, I would have given my right antenna to get it. Gnarly realized that he had again overstepped the invisible boundary between candor and tactlessness. He poked at the nuts with a stylus. Honored by being the first of our species to be offered a guinea pig ship, he murmured. He had not considered this aspect of the matter before, but now that it occurred to him, he was probably right. Oh, I don't mind, really. He waved away the other's sudden commiseration. You know I like being alone most of the time, so I won't find that uncomfortable. Students are students, whether they're terrestrials or Saturnians. I suppose they'll laugh at me behind my back, but then, even here, my students always did that. He gave a hollow laugh and unobtrusively put out one of his hands for a nut. At least on Earth I'll know why they're laughing. There was pain on Slude's expressive face as he firmly removed the nut tray from his friend's reach. I didn't think of it from that angle, Gnarly. Of course you're right. Human beings, from what I've read of them, are not noted for tolerance. It will be difficult, but I'm sure you'll be able to... He choked on the kindly lie. Win them over. Gnarly repressed a bitter laugh. Anyone less likely than he to win over a hostile alien species through sheer personal charm could hardly be found on Saturn. Gnarly Gazan had been chosen as first exchange professor between Saturn and Earth because of his academic reputation, not his personality. But although the choosers had probably not had that aspect of the matter in mind, the choice, he thought, was a wise one. As an individual of solitary habits, he was not apt to be much lonelier on one planet than another. And he had accepted the post largely because he felt that, as an alien being, he would be left strictly alone. This would give him the chance to put in a lot of work on his definitive history of the solar system, a monumental project from which he begrudged all the time he had to spend in fulfilling even the minimum obligations expected of a professor on sociable Saturn. The salary was a weighty factor, too. Not only was it more than twice what he had been getting, but since there would be no necessity for spending more than enough for bare subsistence, he would be able to save up a considerable amount and retire while still comparatively young. It was pleasant to imagine a scholarly life unafflicted by students. He could put up with a good deal for that goal. But how could he alleviate the distress he saw in Karn's face? He did not consciously want to hurt the only person who, for some strange reason, seemed to be fond of him so he said the only thing he could think of to please. All right, Karn, I'll go to the Persils tomorrow night. It would be a deadly bore. Parties always were. And he would eat too much. But, after all, the thought that it would be a long time before he'd ever see any of his own kind again would make the affair almost endurable. And just this once, it would be all right for him to eat as much as he wanted. When he was on Earth, out of reach of decent food, he would probably trim down considerably. I just know you're going to love Earth, Professor Gazan, 
the hostess on the interplanetary liner gushed. I'm sure I shall, he lied politely. She smiled at him too much, overdoing her professional cordiality. Underneath the effusiveness, he sensed the repulsion. Of course, he couldn't blame her for trying not to show her distaste for the strange creature. The effort at concealment was, as a matter of fact, more than he had expected from a terrestrial. But he wished she would leave him alone to meditate. He had planned to get a lot of meditation done on the journey. "'You speak awfully good English,' she told him. He looked at her. "'I am said to have some scholarly aptitude. I understand that's why I was chosen as an exchange professor. It does seem reasonable, doesn't it?' She turned pink, a sign of embarrassment with these creatures he had learned. "'I didn't mean to—' "'To question your ability, Professor. "'It's just that, well, you don't look like a professor.' "'Indeed,' he said frostily. "'And what do I look like, then?' "'She turned even rosier. "'Oh, I... I don't know exactly. "'It's just that, well...' "'And she fled. "'He couldn't resist flicking his antennae forward "'to catch her soda voce conversation with the co-pilot. It was so seldom you got the chance to learn what others were saying about you behind your back. But I could hardly tell him he looks like a teddy bear, could I? He probably doesn't even know what a teddy bear is. Perhaps I don't, Gnarly thought resentfully, but I can guess. With low cunning, the terrestrials seemed to have ferreted out the identity of all his favorite dishes and kept serving them to him incessantly. By the time the ship made planet fall on Earth, he had gained ten grisbets. Oh, well, he thought. I suppose it's all just part of the regular diplomatic service. On Earth, I'll have to eat crude native foods, so I'll lose all the weight again. President Purrington of North America came himself to meet Gnarly at the airfield, because Gnarly was the first interplanetary exchange professor in history. Welcome to our planet, Professor Gazan, he said with warm diplomatic cordiality, wringing Gnarly's upper right hand after a moment of indecision. We shall do everything in our power to make your stay here a happy and memorable one. I wish you would begin by doing something about the climate, Gnarly thought. It was stupid of him not to have realized how hot it would be on Earth. He was really going to suffer in this torrid climate, especially in the tight terrestrial costume he wore over his fur for the sake of conformity. Of course, justice compelled him to admit to himself. The clothes wouldn't have become so snug if he hadn't eaten quite so much on board ship. Purrington indicated the female beside him. "'May I introduce my wife?' "'Oh,' the female gasped. "'Isn't he cute?' The president and Gnarly stared at her in consternation. She looked abashed for a moment, then smiled widely at Gnarly and the press photographers. "'Welcome to Earth, dear Professor Gazan,' she exclaimed, mispronouncing his name, of course. Bending down, she kissed him right upon his fuzzy forehead." Kissing was not a Saturnian practice, nor did Gnarly approve of it. However, he had read enough about Earth to know that Europeans sometimes greeted dignitaries in this peculiar way. Only this place, he had been given to understand, was not Europe but America. "'I am having a cocktail party in your honor this afternoon,' she beamed, smoothing her flowered print dress down over her girdle. "'You'll be there at five sharp, won't you, dear?' "'Delighted,' he promised dismally. He could hardly plead a previous engagement a moment after arriving. "'I've tried to get all the things you like to eat,' she went on anxiously. "'But you will tell me if there's anything special, won't you?' "'I am on a diet,' he said. "'He must be strong. Probably the food would be repulsive anyhow, so he'd have no difficulty controlling his appetite. "'Digestive disorders, you know. A glass of Vichy and a biscuit will be—' He stopped, for there were tears in Mrs. Purrington's eyes. "'Your tummy hurts? Oh, you poor little darling!' "'Gladys,' the president said sharply. There were frismal nuts at Mrs. Purrington's cocktail party, and Vilbar, and even Slipness Bruges, all imported at fabulous expense, Gnarly knew. But then, this was a government affair, and expense means nothing to a government, since, as far as it is concerned, money grows on taxpayers.' Some of the native foods proved surprisingly palatable, too. Pâté de foie gras and champagne and little puff pastries full of delightful surprises. Gnarly was afraid he was making a zlugal of himself. 
However, he thought, trying not to catch sight of his own portly person in the mirrors that walled the room, the lean days were just ahead. Besides, what could he do when everyone insisted on pressing food on him? Try this, Professor Gazan. Do try that, Professor Gazan. Doesn't he look cunning in his little dress suit? They crowded around him. The woman cooed, the men beamed, and gnarly ate. He would be glad when he could detach himself from all this cloying diplomacy and get back to the healthy rancor of the classroom. At school, the odor of chalk dust, ink, and rotting apple cores was enough like its Saturnian equivalent to make Gnarly feel at home immediately. The students would dislike him on sight, he knew. It is in the nature of the young to be hostile toward whatever is strange and alien. They would despise him and jeer at him, and he, in his turn, would give them long, involved homework assignments and such difficult examinations that they would fail. Gnarly waddled briskly up to his desk, which had, he saw, been scaled down to Saturnian size, whereas he had envisioned himself struggling triumphantly with ordinary earth-sized furniture. But the atmosphere was as hot and sticky and intolerable as he had expected. Panting as unobtrusively as possible, he rapped with his pointer. Attention, students! Now should come the derisive babble. But there was a respectful silence, broken suddenly by a shrill feminine whisper of, Ooh, he's so adorable! Followed by the harsh, Shh, Ava! You'll embarrass the poor little thing! Gnarly's face swelled. I am your new professor of Saturnian studies. Saturn, as you probably know, is a major planet. It is much larger and more important than Earth, which is only a minor planet. The students obediently took this down in their notebooks. They carefully took down everything, he said. Even a bout of coughing that afflicted him halfway through seemed to be getting a phonetic transcription. From time to time, they would interrupt his lecture with questions so pertinent, so well thought out, and so courteous that all he could do was answer them. His antennae lifted to catch the whispers that from time to time were exchanged between even the best behaved of the students. Isn't he precious? Seems like a nice fellow. Sound grasp of his subject. Sweet little thing. Unusually interesting presentation. Doesn't he remind you of Winnie the Pooh? Able chap. Just darling. After class, instead of rushing out of the room, they hovered around his desk with intelligent, solicitous questions. Did he like Earth? Was his desk too high? Too low? Didn't he find it hot with all that fur? Such lovely, soft, fluffy fur, though. Do you mind if I stroke one of your paws? Hands, Professor. So cuddly looking. He said yes, as a matter of fact, he was hot. And no, he didn't mind being touched in a spirit of scientific investigation. He had a moment of uplift at the teacher's cafeteria when he discovered lunch to be virtually inedible. The manager, however, had been distressed to see him pick at his food, and by dinner time, a distinguished chef with an expert knowledge of Saturnian cuisine had been rushed from Washington. Since the school food was inedible for all intelligent life forms, everyone ate the Saturnian dishes and praised Gnarly as a public benefactor. That night, alone in the quiet confines of his small room at the men's faculty club, Gnarly had spread out his notes and was about to start work on his history when there was a knock at the door. He trotted over to open it, grumbling to himself. The head of his department smiled brightly down at him. Some of us are going out for a couple of drinks and a gab fest. Care to come along? Gnarly did not see how he could refuse and still carry the Saturnian's burden, so he accepted. Discovering that gin fizzes and Alexander's were even more palatable than champagne and more potent than Vilbar, he told several Saturnine locker room stories, which were hailed with loud merriment. But he was being laughed at, not with, he knew. All this false cordiality, he assured himself, would die down after a couple of days, and then he would be able to get back to work. He must curb his intellectual impatience. In the morning, he found that enrollment in his classes had doubled, and the room was crowded to capacity with the bright, shining, eager faces of young terrestrials athirst for learning. There were apples, chocolates, and imported frismel nuts on his desk, as well as a pressing invitation from Mrs. Purrington for him to spend all his weekends and holidays at the White House. The window was fitted with an air conditioning unit, which, he later discovered, his classes had chipped in to buy for him, 
and the temperature had been lowered to a point where it was almost comfortable. All the students wore coats. When he went out on the campus, women, students, teachers, even strangers, stopped to talk to him, to exclaim over him, to touch him, even to kiss him. Photographers were perpetually taking pictures, some of which turned up in the student union as full-color postcards. They sold like Lagel out of season. Gnarly wrote in Saturnian on the back of one, having miserable time, be glad you're not here, and sent it to Slude. There were cocktail parties, musicales, and balls in Gnarly's honor. When he tried to refuse an invitation, he was accused of shyness and virtually dragged to the affair by laughing members of the faculty. He put on so much weight that he had to buy a complete new terrestrial outfit, which set him back a pretty penny. As a result, he had to augment his income by lecturing to women's clubs. They slobbered appallingly. Gnarly students did all their homework assiduously, and, in fact, put in more work than had been assigned. At the end of the year, not only did all of them pass, but with flying colors. I hope you'll remember, Professor Gazan, the president of the university said, that there will always be a job waiting for you here, a non-exchange professorship. Love to have you. Thank you, Gnarly replied politely. Mrs. Purrington broke into loud sobs when he told her he was leaving Earth. Oh, I'll miss you so, Gnarly. You will write, won't you? Yes, of course, he said grimly. That made 218 people to whom he'd had to promise to write. It was fortunate he was traveling as a guest of the North American government, he thought, as he supervised the loading of his matched interplanetary luggage, his eight steamer baskets, his leather-bound encyclopedia Terrestria, with his name imprinted in gold on each volume, his Indian war bonnet, his oil painting of the president, and his six cases of champagne, all parting gifts, onto the liner. Otherwise, the fee for excess luggage would take what little remained of his bank account. There had been so many expenses, clothes and hostess gifts and ice. Not all his mementos were in his luggage. A new rare metal watch gleamed on each of his four furry wrists. A brand new tropskin wallet, platinum keychain, and uranium fountain pen were in his pocket and a diamond and curium bauble clasped a tie lovingly hand-painted by a female student. The argyles on his fuzzy ankles had been knitted by another. Still another devoted pupil had presented him with a hand-woven plastic case full of frismal nuts to eat on the way back. "'Well, Gnarly,' Slood said, his face swelling with joy. "'Well, well. You've put on weight, I see.' Gnarly dropped into his old chair with a sigh. Surely Slude might have picked something else to comment on first, his haggardness, for instance, or the increased spirituality of his expression. Nothing else to do on earth in your leisure moments but eat, I suppose, Slude said, pushing over the nut tray. Even their food. Have some frismals. No, thank you, Gnarly replied coldly. Slude looked at him in distress. Oh, how you must have suffered! Was it very, very bad, Gnarly? Gnarly hunched low in his chair. It was just awful. I'm sure they didn't mean to be unkind, Slude assured him. Naturally, you were a strange creature to them, and they're only... Unkind? Gnarly gave a bitter laugh. They practically killed me with kindness. It was fuss, fuss, fuss all the time. Now, Gnarly, I do wish you wouldn't be quite so sarcastic. I'm not being sarcastic. And I wasn't a strange creature to them. It seems there's a sort of popular child's toy on Earth known as a... He winced. Teddy bear. I aroused pleasant childhood memories in them, so they showered me with affection and edibles. Slude closed his eyes in anguish. You are very brave, Gnarly, he said, almost reverently. Very brave and wise and good. Certainly that would be the best thing to tell our people. After all... The terrestrials are our allies. We don't want to stir up public sentiment against them. But you can be honest with me, Gnarly. Did they refuse to serve you in restaurants? Were you segregated in public vehicles? Did they shrink from you when you came close? Gnarly beat the desk with all four hands. I was hardly ever given the chance to be alone. They crawled all over me. Restaurants begged for my trade. I had to hire private vehicles because in public ones I was mobbed by admirers. 
such a short time slewed murmured and already suspicious of even me your oldest friend but don't talk about it if you don't want to gnarly tell me though did they sneer at you and whisper half audible insults did they you're right gnarly snapped i don't want to talk about it slewed placed a comforting hand upon his shoulder perhaps that's wisest until the shock of your experience has worn off gnarly made an irritable noise the Purzels are giving a Vilbar party tonight, Slood said. But I know how you feel about parties. I've told them you're exhausted from your trip and won't be able to make it. Oh, you did, did you? Gnarly asked ironically. What makes you think you know how I feel about parties? But there's an interesting saying on Earth. Travel is so broadening. He looked down at his bulges with tolerant amusement. In more ways than one, in case the meaning eludes you very sound psychologically. I've discovered that I like parties. I like being liked. If you'll excuse me, I'm going to inform the Purzels that I shall be delighted to come to their party. Care to join me? Well, Slood mumbled, I'd like to, but I have so much work. Introvert, said Gnarly, and he began dialing the Purzels. End of the Vilbar Party by Evelyn E. Smith